All right, here we go. Today we have Cato Kalin, who was living in O.J. Simpson's guest house at the time of the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, who became a key witness in what became the trial of the century. Welcome to Vlad TV. Glad to be here. Nice to meet you, Vlad. Thank you. You as well. Well, let's start in the very beginning, because you're part of a very important story. So you actually grew up in Wisconsin? Yeah. I'm uh, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, six siblings. And, uh, you know, I, I went to college at Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and I had a TV show. It was called Cato and Friends. My whole life has really been about making my parents laugh, making the family laugh. And I said, you know what? I got I to gotta go out of Wisconsin if I'm going to be successful and, and get into uh, acting and, and uh, some sort of stand-up or something. So I, I made the move uh, in 1979 and uh, transferred to a Cal State Fullerton because back then school was free and I played baseball at Wisconsin, thought I could become a pro. My goal was to be a pro ball player also because I was a pretty good pitcher. But as soon as I saw the guys, how big they were, and I didn't get whiskers till I was 38, I said, I don't have a shot. Although I got to tell you, Vlad, I, I could throw it 89 miles an hour. Back okay. then, that was pretty, that's some speed. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So you eventually moved to Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. And you started appearing in some movies. I think Beach Fever was the first one. Yeah. Beach Fever. If you're ever on an aircraft carrier, you might see it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, but Beach, Beach Fever, I got to tell you, because it was, there's so many great stories of Beach Fever, but that was a, uh, a uh, shot up in Oxnard, Oxnard Shores in Ventura. But I remember Sil Sylvester Stallone came to the set one time. And I was like, oh my God, Stallone is here. This is, I kind of made it. He, he, he actually saw me acting. And, uh, and then I had a, 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 th three different commercials. So I did a Coca-Cola slice and a cherry Coke. So uh, I thought, this is really easy, easy money. And then it just kind of dried up. But I, I, was, I never, never, stopped, never stopped pursuing gold, even as we speak today. Yeah. So all I do is I, I, I keep trying to chase this dream. Right. In 89, you were in a movie called Night Shadow. I shot a werewolf picture. <laughs> right. It's a low-budget uh, horror movie. Uh, there, yeah, it's pretty much low-budget. It's like, <laughs> you know, you got paid in lotto scratchers. Here okay. you go. Good luck. <laughs> no. uh, okay. So here you are. You're an aspiring actor. You're trying to make your way in Hollywood. And right around 1992, OJ and Nicole got a divorce. Now, you hadn't met anyone at that point. Right. I'm just kind of setting yeah. the, the stage of what starts to happen. At the time, OJ was, was very wealthy. He had $10 million in assets, and he was making more than a million dollars every year in income, including uh, half a million from Hertz Rent-A-Car, which uh, that kind of comes back up later on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And after the divorce, you actually meet Nicole Brown Simpson. Correct. How long after the divorce did you guys actually meet? Well, I, see, I didn't even know it was 92. So it's 92. We met at the in, beginning of 93. Uh -huh. uh, Actually, it was probably 90, 92, becoming 93, because I had a business with an actor named Grant Kramer, mm -hmm. successful actor. He was in General Hospital, very good looking woman. He was a, a stud. So he was my partner in a casting business, and we did pretty well. We said, let's go to Aspen. Everybody goes to Aspen for the New Year's. So we, uh, after Christmas, we drove and uh, went to all the hottest parties. And back in the 90s, it was the place to be. And Grant was sort of an easy ticket to get everything because they recognized him. And I was not recognizable, but I was always there for comic relief. He, Nicole saw him, said hi to him because that he had done some ski events, uh, celebrity ski events with Nicole and OJ. And so she recognized Grant and they just uh, hit it off immediately. Okay. So they start to kind of hang out. Yeah. And you're kind of a third wheel in this whole situation. Yeah, I okay. was I was, third, I was a comic relief. I was the third wheel. Uh, Faye Resnick was also there uh, at that tr trip in Aspen. I didn't know. I'm saying these names because people know them now. I didn't know who they were then. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, in I actually ended up dating an actress from that trip named Catherine Oxenberg, who was like a big deal. Oh, from a dynasty, right? Right. Okay. And that's even right. before Cato was famous, Vlad. <laughs> so we went on for about three months after this and uh, from dynasty. So the trip was just amazing. It was just so much fun. And then uh, uh, I became friends of Nicole because of seeing them for that week and just hanging out and, and just laughing a lot. Okay, so Grant Kramer and Nicole Brown Simpson start to have a relationship. And I guess during the course of dating, you would sometimes come along as well? Yeah. Yeah, we, we did a, pretty much a, a lot of things that uh, if he came by, because I, I was uh, 
at the time I wasn't living yet at Nicole's on Gretna Green. Mm -hmm. But through the next week or so in LA of meeting up, I saw her play. She had a party on Gretna Green. And at the party, I said, God, I was living in Hermosa Beach, so, so people would know. Hermosa Beach into Brentwood, and LA, it's like an hour drive, mm -hmm. regard, traffic. So I said, who's living there? And she said, nobody. And she even said, would you like to live there? I said, I would love to live there. She gave me a price for rent. I moved in probably that week. Okay, what was it, like 500 bucks a month or something? Yeah, it was actually 475. 475, okay. And you know, you know how rumors go and so forth. There wasn't like a threesome type relationship yeah. or nothing <laughs> freaky like that going on? Yeah, no, I tell people the last time I had a threesome, I had to blow up the menage a trois, the trois. <laughs> they, the joke, let me tell the joke again. <laughs> last time I had a threesome, I had to blow up the trois. The trois. <laughs> no, okay. no, 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 no threesomes. It's like uh, the old joke. I had a threesome last weekend, but I had two no-shows. Folks, please, <laughs> where are we? I had two no-shows. <laughs> it's not fun though, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so now you're living in... Nicole's guest house. Yes. And she has two young kids at the time, yeah. Justin and Sydney, who's nine years old and six years old. Yeah. Six that okay. Now you have a daughter as well. Also nine. Also nine. So would, would your daughter kind of come over and play with the kids? Yeah. I would uh so when I when I moved in there, I, I think the most important thing is I, I no one even knew I was a parent and I, I understand I was raised a very large family and my daughter and I were very close and Laughter was the key, even though I didn't live with her, I'd pick her up on the weekends. So they immediately became friends. And I, I think Nicole saw that, how I handled her kids. And uh, I was not the babysitter. I was I was labeled all these things that I was not. I wasn't the pool boy. I uh, had a casting business and I'd be working very hard at that. But I loved her kids and I love making them laugh more than anything. And the, the thing is, you know, after a few months, uh, and this is not me being big headed or, or you know, bragging about anything, but I thought it was the sweetest thing when they got a dog and they named it Cato because they all decided we love Cato, we're gonna name the dog Cato. Okay, and your nickname Cato, was that before you met the Simpsons? Oh, my nick it's been uh, since uh, over 50 years. Okay, and that was after the Bruce Lee character? Yes, it was, my parents and my okay. brother said doing karate. <laughs> so I was Cato, and also people got it from the Pink Panther, not now Cato. So, but Cato was uh, more pro uh, Bruce Lee. Okay, so you're living in this guest house. You're cool with her kids, and you would pick up her kids after school every so often to just yeah, sort of if, help if out. If she needed help, I'd help. Okay, and was this the time that the Kardashian kids would come over and wake you up in bed and so forth? Yeah, so they were very close to the Kardashian girls, and the Kardashians that kind of on Gretna Green would come by sometimes, and then obviously, obviously I met the Kardashians through the period of just being there before they're famous and... uh yeah, there's times they come to my guest house because it was sort of like, let's go to Cato's because Cato's the fun place to be, jumping on the bed, let's wake up Cato. And I was working hours, honestly, till 4 or 5 a.m. coming home, and then I'd hear them, they'd go to school at 7 a.m. or whatever, and it would be in there, and they're, they're waking me up, and I'm like, I still, I never complain. It was just kind of fun. And I, I, and I always thought, it's just, these are just such, they're great kids, great family. You can see the race really well. Okay, at what point do you actually meet O.J.? So, OJ didn't happen for at least, I have to imagine, probably a three weeks, maybe a month. Uh, you know, when he come by, I never was there when he came by to pick up kids or anything. And uh, at one point, I finally met, and he was gracious and r very polite, and I introduced myself. And and there was, uh, I, I, I think, in hindsight now, I can't remember the person told me that. I think that they had someone that checked up to find out who Cato was. And I don't blame him at all. I was gonna see who's living at the house of his kids to find out if I had any kind of relationship with Nicole, anything. And I think it came with a clean slate. So I believe that is why he was so kind to me. Okay, he hired a private investigator. I, I'm, I, I'm a, or someone to check up on who I was. But I was told at a point they, I was, there was someone hired to find out who Cato was. Well, yeah, I mean, you would think that any ex-husband father would be concerned that you have this grown man who's not a family member, good-looking guy with long blonde hair, and he's not only around your attractive ex-wife, but he's also around the young kids. Right. So there's a lot of kind of red flags that right. I, I would, get like you off. said, I would do the same. Yeah. I find out who's actually who's, who's there living with my kids. Okay. At the time that you moved into the house, they were divorced. But I guess right around May of 93, they try to work it out. 
Yeah. They would go on dates. They would have dates uh, and uh, uh, try to work it out. And uh, yeah, I thought it was the best thing ever. And uh, I didn't see any physical altercations, but I did hear a verbal battle and all that. And, um, you know, a verbal, I, a verbal, I think there was argument. arguments going on. Okay. And then I would just, I, I've, I've said this before that when I was raised, if my parents fought, they never did it without kissing each other at the end. And I, I'm serious. So I said, well, you guys should try that. So I would always say, you guys shouldn't fight. And I would just, uh, and I was just a young kid and I'm giving advice, but I was really speaking from my heart saying, Hey, yeah. you guys got the world. This is the, you got the best life. I mean, you're in Redwood. You got, what problem could you have? Well, they were, they had problems. Okay. Well, one of the problems happened on October 25th, 1993. You were living there, but you were out during the time. Correct. So, you know, I went and looked into this whole situation. Apparently what happened was OJ was at Nicole's house and he was going through a photo album and saw a picture from one of her old boyfriends. Right. Do you know who that is or? Uh, some of the name, was it, was it Keith? Was his name Keith I'm, I'm or someone? Sure. Uh, if that's, I see, I'm hearing the story of what you're telling me. So I think it might've been a gentleman named Keith, but uh, so they got into an argument over this picture, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Was this guy also around at the time? Was Nicole was Nicole dating other men during this time? Because she was, you know, single at that point. Yeah, I think she. I think that girlfriends had weekends out uh, often. I think mm. they did. I know every morning she had four girlfriend, th three other girls, and Nicole. Every morning they would go jogging and then go to their house for coffee, and I think that was their that was the view of TV show back then. <laughs> them having it, and they uh, talked about their lives, but. Getting back to October 25th, um, I wasn't there. Yeah. But I saw police cars when I pulled up. Right. And OJ had apparently already left. Right. So so let's get into the story. Okay. So she got into an argument with OJ over a picture of an old boyfriend. Things started to escalate, and she made a 911 call. 911 emergency. Can you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just send somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. He just <laughs> drove up. over. Okay, wait a minute. What kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco, but first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Before. Okay, wait a minute. What's your name? Nicole Simpson. Okay, is he the sportscaster or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Thank what is, you. Wait a minute. We're sending the police. What is he doing? Is he threatening you? I'm going nuts. Okay. Has he threatened you in any way, or or is he just harassing you? You're gonna hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. Okay. Just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's gonna beat the shit. Wait a minute. Wait. Just stay on the line so we can know what's going on until the police get there. Okay. Okay, Nicole. Uh huh. Just a moment. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. Okay. He went home and now he's back. Okay. My kids are up there sleeping and I don't want anything to happen. Okay. Has he hit you today or no? No. Okay. You don't need any paramedics or anything? Uh-uh. Okay. You just want him to he leave? my door. He broke the whole back door in. And then he left and he came back? And he came and he practically knocked my upstairs door down, but he pounded it and then he screamed and hollered and I tried to get him out of the bedroom because the kids were sleeping in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he wanted somebody's phone number and I gave him my phone book and was going to, or I gave, put my phone book down to write, mm -hmm. write down the phone number that he wanted and mm -hmm. then he took my phone book with all my stuff in it. What does he say? What do you want just stay on the line, okay? Is he upset with something that you did? Oh, a long time ago, it always comes back. Police arrived. Now, you're gone by the time, you know, at this point. But the police arrived. Uh, he's gone. Well, no, no, no. He was actually, well, when the police arrived, I'm not sure if he was gone or not. But I guess uh, OJ had actually offered to pay for the doors. Okay, I wasn't there. You're right. Yeah. I was not there. 
he he offered to pay for the doors that he had kicked down and he felt bad and he actually wasn't arrested. Mm -hmm. So then you arrived at the house. So when you arrived, you saw the door broken down. Mm -hmm. What did you think? Well, I didn't go into the house at all. I saw cops. uh, I thought I went right to my room. I was trying to figure out what went on. So I didn't know what was going on. And then um, uh, I remember opening the door and seeing it was okay to come out there. I came out and uh, I I believe they're still there. I introduced myself. She introduced who I was. And then uh, uh, they asked if I would help. And she had a hammer and nails. And I put the door door back together best we could. Mm. Okay. Well, essentially, Nicole didn't want to prosecute OJ. And the matter was just dropped. Right. So that situation kind of came and went. Well, then in 1994, Nicole decided to move out of that house and move into the Bundy townhouse. Correct. Why did she move out of that house? I think it was rent related. I think the price it wasn't it wasn't owned by OJ or her. It was a rent. It was a rent, and I think it went so sky high. And I don't know what she made on alimony. So either it wasn't enough to cover it. I don't know if the alimony was uh, reduced or. I, I have no idea, but it was, I know, financial that she had to move into a, a townhouse. Okay. Was Nicole working at all? Or was she making, basically surviving off of the alimony yeah. and, and child she, support? I, she did not have a job. She didn't have a job at all. How would she spend her days? Um, she went with girlfriends, cough, jogging, a workout. Uh, a lot of times family members would come by. She'd go there to Laguna or Dana mm-hmm. Point and- um, I, and I don't know if she was had a, a side job or not, but I don't think so. I don't think she had a job. Okay. Well, I mean, she she dated Grant Kramer at one point. Was she dating other men? Were other men coming by the house or anything of no, that sort? No. I mean, she had she had uh, if she had a male friend, they'd be a, at a large party where everybody knew her. But okay. uh, no, I, she she really didn't. When I was there, it wasn't too much dating. Got it. I think she was just a house a house mom. Yeah, always taking care of the kids. Okay, so Nicole moves out of the house that you're living in, you know, and she moves into a townhouse on Bundy Street. Correct. Now, that house did not have a guest house. It was like a duplex, right? It was like one house with two people living side by side, essentially. Yeah, it was, and she owned one of the townhomes. Yeah. And uh, I went, I was at inside the house when uh, she said, you got to see what I bought. So I went and I saw it. And then she said, there's a room. If you want this room, it'll be yours. And I just, I, I didn't feel comfortable and uh and i was invited to live there and i just didn't feel right about it and um th- that's when oj had said till you find a place you can live in one of the bungalows so i don't know if he didn't feel me comfortable also living there but i from i did not feel comfortable mm-hmm. to move into uh into a house that's in the same under the same roof okay and the house in rockingham in Brentwood had what three or four guest three houses? Three, the uh, yeah, there are three bungalows, not connected to those. They're on the side yeah. of uh, the uh, his property. And his daughter Arnell lived in one of them. Correct. Anyone else live in the third or fourth one? No, uh, maybe at times there were, but uh, at that time it was just myself and Arnell. Okay, so you move in to OJ's guest house. Mm-hmm. How's Nicole with this? Uh, from her friends and not, she was pissed off. Really? Yeah. She said, this man manipulated you and I didn't feel it. I just didn't feel right with me going, uh, in staying on the same roof. And at the time I'm looking for places. Uh, and this is the part that no, one, I, I really was sincerely was looking for places to live. I stayed at OJ's for six months and, um, uh, I found a place on San Vicente in May at the end of May hmm. and, uh, was going to move in. So. I, I mean, I know everything's hindsight, but that's that, that's the God's honest truth. Right. Well, you were paying $500 a month to Nicole, but when you moved to OJ's, it was free. 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 Offered. Never once accepted anything. Said, I don't need your money. And he would say that. I was like, it's kind of cool. And uh, I, it's, you know, uh, I know that's where you get the, the term people coming up with their terms of who Cato is. I mean, because no one knew who Cato was. Immediately, uh, uh, immediate turned me over to becoming a, uh, from a celebrity to a freeloader, to a pariah, to an assassin's target. Yeah. I had no chance. So the court of public opinion on that was already made. Okay. So now you're living in the back of OJ's house. Correct. Now, I guess occasionally you would help pick up the kids, but not that often, right? No, not not yeah. like how it was with Nicole. No, no. And like, I, I was never, if they asked me to do something, if I was available, I would do it. I was not a, uh, I wasn't hired by them or anything, but I was always there to help. 
Okay, now OJ had a maid named Michelle who did not like you. I thought she she didn't like me. <laughs> she, I, 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 maybe, uh, may, I don't know if she liked me or not. I thought she did like me. Wasn't there a situation where she was trying to get you out of there and OJ oh, that, said, oh no, I make the decisions that the oh, maid's not going to tell well, me? Okay, getting that, yeah, I. that's was why I was looking for places. She was sort of the push for me to keep looking for places. But I, I did not feel like, uh, I did not hate her. So I, it's hard to say that. But she was never like, really like, I mean, get out of here. She was like, you find a place yet? She would do that. Hmm. And uh, I would make my own bed. I, mean, I don't know if it was a problem for her to clean the, I wasn't, you know, a slob. But I, I think she probably wanted me out. I, I think she was quite possessive. Okay. Was there a situation between Nicole and the maid, where there was a rumor that Nicole slapped her or something like that, or I, I heard there was something up that Mich that Michelle did not like Nicole at all. I didn't see anything of like that, but I think what you're saying, if there was a story that came out, that could be true. Okay, I, I don't, I don't personally know or see it, but I remember there was some uh, friction between those two. Okay, so like you had said earlier, Nicole. Well, and OJ, they were all friends with the Kardashians. Robert Sr. was yeah. was alive. At that point, uh, Chris uh, and Nicole were friends. And you went to a few cookouts and you got to really get to know them and they would all hang out. And I guess after dropping off the kids to school, uh, Nicole, Chris Kardashian, and a couple other uh, women, they would go jogging. Yeah, they would do jogging pretty much every morning, yeah. Okay, and sometimes during their jog, they would pass by Mezzaluna Restaurant, which is about 0.9 miles from the Bundy house. Okay, so on the night of June 12th, now this is outside of your knowledge, but this was all kind of happening. I'm going to set up a bit of a timeline. So at 6.30 p.m., Nicole Brown, uh, her mom, and her kids, and maybe one or two other people, I think her sister, they went to Mezzaluna Restaurant to go eat. At 8 p.m., Nicole and her kids left Mezzaluna to stop for ice cream on the way home. At 9.15, Nicole's sister uh, called Nicole and told her that their mom had actually left some uh, glasses at the restaurant. Ronald Goldman, who she had known from going to the restaurant and jogging by there, actually volunteered to return those glasses to his house. Now, from the restaurant to Nicole's Bundy house is like 0.9 miles. Mm -hmm. Very close. Now, on your end, right around the same time at 9 o'clock, you're hanging out in the guest house and OJ comes by your door. Yeah. Tell me what happens next. So OJ came by his, my door and uh, he asked if I could break a $100 bill, which I couldn't. But I said, I have $40 and I gave it to him. And uh, he said he was going to uh, head out to get something to eat. And I had not eaten. I had played basketball. I went running. I was an insane runner, uh, 15 miles a day. And I said, I'm starving. Can I come along? And this always stands out in, in me that I, I could see there's a pause. He didn't like, you know, not that he didn't get excited for God, Kate was inviting himself, but I could feel that he did not want me to be invited. So... Uh, he paused and said, okay. I had no idea where we were going to go. And he, we ended up driving to a McDonald's. And it was, uh, uh, according to the police and the detectives told me, they asked me, why did they go to Matt McDonald's, the closer one? I didn't even know. First of all, I didn't know where we were going. Okay, so you jumped in his Bentley. Yeah. And he's driving. And you guys drive to the McDonald's. Yes. I remember during the trial, they asked if you had seen his hands and so forth, and his hands didn't have any cuts on him or anything else like that, right? Yeah, I said, he's driving the car. It wasn't something I was focused on, but yeah, I didn't notice anything. Okay. So you guys go through the McDonald's drive through mm -hmm. You guys both order food. Correct. Now you're holding on to your food, but he starts to eat his food on the way home? Yeah, he. Uh, it was a, 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 a quarter pounder, I believe a quarter pounder. I had a chicken sandwich. And he, in, within a bite or two, it was gone. He had that, I, I think he said a bag of fries, but he ate the sandwich immediately. And I just waited in the car, not to eat in his Bentley. Was he talking to you about relationships that day? Uh, earlier in the day he did. Okay, what did he say? He was, he was saying about 
uh, just something about women. He goes, you can't make these women happy. And he was, uh, he had dated, he's dating a Paula, but he, there was an, another woman he had mentioned, I can't think of the name now, of a, uh, another, another woman. So he was like talking about two different women. So something must have happened. And he was, he seemed, he, to me, he seemed uh, depressed. When you talk to a buddy that's going through a breakup is what I felt like I was talking to a buddy of mine. Saying, geez, uh, you know, it's whatever. And uh, uh, he might've mentioned Nicole, I don't remember, but I remember him feeling like he's a little bit down in the dumps. And, uh, and that was really basically it. And, okay, so you guys come back to the estate and you have your food, but OJ didn't want to, well, he already ate. Right. right. Well, to the point of that is I got out of the car, the Bentley was parked. I walked to his house like I was going to walk in to uh, eat with him the rest of the food. And uh, when I opened the door and I turned around, he was still at the Bentley at the, you know, at the front door of the Bentley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, oh, I'll, I'll eat my room. So I went and that was it. OK, so you grabbed your McDonald's. Yep. You go back to the guest house. And you start to eat. This is around 9.45 p.m. Now, right around 9.50 p.m., Ron Goldman leaves the restaurant with a white envelope with Nicole's mom's glasses. At 10.15 p.m., you know, Nicole Brown, the, the townhouse she lived in, like I said in the beginning, it's like two units. So she's got a neighbor with a, an adjoining wall. Uh, his name is Pablo Fen Fenvis? I never, okay. I never met him. Uh, he actually, in police reports, he said that he heard some cries and the constant barking of a dog. Now, this is where it gets kind of fuzzy. According to Chris Darden, you know, who was the co-prosecutor in the case, he felt that OJ was stalking Nicole. He was somewhere kind of lurking around the house. He saw Ron show up at the house, assumed that Ron was sleeping with Nicole, a you know, young, good-looking guy, and so forth. OJ somehow got Nicole to come outside, at which point he started to stab Nicole. And then Ron came outside as well, and then OJ killed him as well. This is according to Chris Darden. But, you know, from... The Bundy house, where Nicole was living, to the Rockingham house, it's only two miles away. Mm -hmm. So if you jump in a car, it's six minutes each way. Very close. So essentially from 945, you didn't know where OJ was. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Okay, so... Here you are in your house, well, in, your, in the guest house, eating McDonald's, and um, you're making some phone calls and Correct. so forth, Correct. right? I think you called one friend named Tom, was it? Tom, he was a, a lawyer mm -hmm. and, uh, and a, a prosecutor. And I was, I was making a joke like, I just got McDonald's, uh, eating with OJ, you know, doing a thing like a buddy, like, hey, how's your Sunday or whatever night it was? How's your day? And uh, was a, he's a buddy of mine from Wisconsin, and to this day, he's my one of my best friends. Um, and uh, and that and that gentleman later on became uh, was the United States Attorney huh. Bush appointed. Okay. Uh, so it's it's sort of it, amazing. Is uh, great, smart, smart, smart man. And then I was talking to a girl named Rachel. Yeah, Rachel Ferrer. Rachel Ferrer and Rachel and I were friends. We we're not boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, we were, we went out on dates. Uh, you know, it was a non-committal relationship, but definitely she's great. And we were discussing uh, her to come over to my place or I should, she goes, no, you come to my place. And so I had two phone calls going on constantly while yeah. I have my McDonald's. Well, while you're having these phone calls at 1025 PM, a, a limo driver pulled up, Alan Park, because OJ was about to head to Chicago. Correct. And then at 1040 PM, you heard three loud thumps. Yeah, I, I call it thumps. I heard it was loud enough for me to think it was an earthquake. And I, I also realized that the picture behind my wall. Now, there is no window. It's just a wall. So I don't know what's going behind the wall. So I heard this and I said, geez, this is a, I, I was on with Rachel. I said, did we just have an earthquake? My picture moved. And she says, no, I didn't feel anything here. So uh, that, okay. was, that was just, sorry. And I would think nothing of it until, of course, 
yeah. the after you start to go, well, that noise. Now, in hindsight, what could that have been? Well, you heard that. You heard those thumps. Your picture moved. And uh, right around the same time, around 1040, 1045, uh, the limo driver buzzes the intercom, but he gets no response. Mm -hmm. At 1055, the limo driver calls his boss and tells him that uh, OJ is not home. He was told to wait until 1115 because OJ is always late. Right around 1057, the limo driver sees uh, a black man around six foot, 200 pounds, walk across the driveway towards the house. And we're not quite sure who that is, whether that's OJ or whether it's someone else. We don't know. Right. You didn't see anyone at the house outside of OJ? No. Okay. So right around 11 o'clock, you leave the guest house to go check out the noise, Right. Yeah, I I can the my I could hear some a ringing. It's not I can't. It's like fuzzy, but it keeps going on and on. So I don't know if that's the gate because I wasn't familiar with all the systems of how that worked. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's a, so I went. This is strange. So I went outside, and they, I think going back in my memory, I think the limo driver was out, and I don't know if I let him in or anybody. He he and I were talking, and then uh, there was luggage out in front. And I remember helping the limo driver and I loading up the limo. Okay. And uh, at one point, OJ actually buzzes him in, I guess. He said, okay. And uh, he comes out and he said he had overslept and he had just gotten out of the shower. Around uh, 11, 11.15, you guys start to load up the limousine with OJ's bags. And you're actually helping him load up. Correct. But there's a knapsack in the vicinity. What's going on with that knapsack? There's a knapsack about 25 feet away from where all the other uh, luggage is. So I run. I get a good jog. I got to get this one. And I was, I was within reaching distance as OJ had screamed, no, I got that. And then I just looked like I was here to pick it up. What? I, I, so I didn't understand. I went, oh, okay. So that was it. Okay. Never saw that bag again. I don't think anybody ever saw that bag. But to me, it was a uh, look like a college uh, knapsack you put on over your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and you told OJ about the noise, right? Yeah. And how did he react? Uh, I, I, there was no real reaction. I go, and I even asked the limo driver also. I said, I think you guys, we had an earthquake. Okay. So that was still in my mind that this, because it, it was, uh, to me, it was confusing hearing a noise with uh, a, a picture moving. Okay, and then by 11.15, uh, OJ leaves to the airport. And that was basically the end of what you thought was the end of the story. Uh, by 11.45, he gets on a flight to Chicago. At 12.10 a.m., the bodies of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman are found outside of her townhouse. And they find one glove at the townhouse as well. At 5 a.m., Mark Furman and Philip Vanader, the two detectives yeah, assigned the Vanader. case, they actually arrive at O.J. Simpson's house. But O.J.'s gone, so they can't get into the house. And I guess they see some bloodstains around the Ford Bronco. And Furman decides to jump over the wall to get into the estate. And I guess he goes to the guest house where Arnell is staying. Uh, yeah, I think he. I think uh, he went and actually opened the gate for the other ones to come in. So they're all there. I don't think he was just by himself. If okay. I, if I, well, I can say this only because they came to my door. I didn't know they had gone to Arnell's. I remember four being at my door. Okay, four detectives. Okay, so they go to Arnell and to you. Mm -hmm. And what do they tell you at this point? So I have a knock on my door. I'm hazy. I, I don't even, if it's, I don't know if I'm dreaming a knock or what's going on. And the entire night was a bizarre night. And I think this is, to me, was what it was, it was that June gloom. I, it was just a hazy night. And just through the night of the earthquake and calling up my buddy Tom and, and uh, Rachel, everything was confusing to me. So the knock of the door, I did associate a time. And I just uh, opened the door and saw four guys in. It was still dark. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, hi, I, I, I just opened the door. And then at one point they said, we're uh, LAPD. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they I invited them in, and then they had said to me, "Oh, there were four of them," and they said, uh, uh, "Who are you? And can we ask you what you wore last night?" I said, "Okay," and I, the whole time I'm going, "Did OJ's plane crash? Did someone? Did uh, you know?" That was my first thought because I knew he went to Chicago. Yeah. Like, what's going on? And then they just looked over; they didn't really answer me, and uh, then right. they looked in my eyes and did everything. Right, you don't know what's what's happening. No at this idea. Point. Okay, what about the daughter, Arnell? Are you talking to her at all or no? No, I, it was, we were never uh, put together. Okay. Well, uh, by 7 a.m., they actually declared it a crime scene, and they went to go get a search warrant for the house. So do you go into the main house at this point? Uh, the detectives escorted us into the main house and Arnell, and we're in the uh, main living room, and uh, they're questioning, they're just telling us uh, separately uh, about our night, I'm telling basically what I'm telling you, uh, and um, and then I hear uh, Tom Lang on the phone uh, telling the the Browns family that uh, uh, your daughter's been killed, and that's when I first realized that that's what it was all about, and that um, uh, he uh, they hate telling people over the phone, but they knew the media was already going to get it, mm -hmm. so they better tell them before the media finds out and breaks it to the to parents. So they had to make sure that the detective said it before they found it out from a source that was uh, the news. And then I was escorted out for questioning. And when I was escorted out, I just I remember this because of uh, the impact it made. The, uh, while I'm walking, they were talking to me and said, oh, be careful of the blood. And there I, I looked and sure enough, it was a wood peg floor, those little dark pegs, but I could see the blood around the pegs and a blood like a little trail. I said, oh my God. Okay, and how do you react to this? I mean, because you were friends with Nicole before OJ, and Correct. you were playing with her kids, and you, your daughter and her daughter, right. and, and, you know, because you, you lived with Nicole for how long? Uh, six and a half months, seven months. Okay, you know, a good good amount of time to yeah. get to know somebody. And now you just found out that she's dead. Yeah, and I had I, I was the guy privy to I was I lived I lived with both sides. Yeah. And I think that's why they made me this, uh, I guess, important witness. But I lived on both sides of what I saw. Uh, it was, it was knowing, Nicole, I didn't know how Nicole died. I thought they were coming over. I didn't know the crime scene, the blood. Uh, I thought, you know, OJ was in Chicago and I was thinking, oh my God, this is horrible. This is just horrible news. Uh, and um, that's, that's how I left. I, I did, there was no answer to that. Next thing I was at the police station of, um, of having that news, no phone, nothing, just sitting in a room with the uh, police officers. Uh, okay, and you at that point you were wishing that OJ wasn't guilty. Oh yeah, I didn't want OJ guilty. I didn't. I, I thought, I thought he was gone. So I thought they're waiting to find out that they're going to say that uh, he has to know that his uh, strange wife has, has uh, been killed. Right, and your mom, when the news broke, thought that you were dead because she thought that you were Ron Goldman, you know, the other guy. Because that was no never was released Ron Goldman for. I, I don't know, it was quite a long time. Mm. I didn't know anything that I had this until I found my phone machine when I was released. And it was, it was call after call of my mom. She ran the entire tape of her crying and crying. And with me not answering her, I think she was feeling that I, I was the one that was killed. So, uh, but hearing her voice was, it was so powerful. It was, I, I was bawling because my mom was going through this of not knowing. Okay. Now, OJ got the call that his wife was dead while he was in Chicago, so he quickly comes back to L.A. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Kind of? Yeah, it gets very interesting. When OJ comes back, they notice that there are some cuts on his finger on his left hand. Now, when they asked him about it, he said after finding out the news about Nicole that he cut his finger in the hotel and they even uh, had confirmed that he had gone to like the hotel lobby to get some band-aids and everything else like that. And he said, okay, yeah, that's how I cut my finger. Right. But then the police told him that they had found blood inside of the car. And he right. said, oh yeah, no, I cut my finger before Chicago, but I don't remember how I cut it. Correct, yeah. Is know if you recut it or not from reading, you know, evidence uh, later of reading certain books and and hearing, uh, you know, testimony from before. That was the big thing of uh, how could he have 
cut himself and not know how he had this. I guess it was a massive, a pretty big cut that you would know how you yeah. had that one. Little nicks, and, you know, sometimes I get those. I don't know that, but this was a major cut. And also, I guess the police, uh, there was evidence of they went and saw that the, not, not that the hotels that they used at that hotel were these thick glasses and they demonstrated dropping it in sinks and they couldn't break it. Uh -huh. And so that was a, a, Tom Lang told me that's also in his book, Evidence Dismissed of certain things that was dismissed and never used in trial. But that was one of it. They tried uh, attesting these things. They yeah. wanted to make sure. Right. I mean, because from the outside looking in, here you are hanging out with him. His hands are clean, no cuts. He goes to Chicago and it sounds like he almost creates a situation around the cut hand, mm -hmm. which doesn't check out because there was blood inside the car right. ahead of time. And when they actually check the house where you were staying on the other side of that wall, that's where they found the other bloody glove. And uh, OJ's blood was on both gloves as well as Ron and uh, Nicole's blood. Right. And there was blood basically in both places, both the Bundy house and OJ's main house. Right. And uh, that was uh, when they had the statistics that came out, it was like one in 600 billion yeah. of Pers of being 100% positive. Well, but at this point, OJ's not officially a suspect yet. Mm -hmm. So he's hanging out at his house and people are starting to come over. Uh, some of the Jackson 5 come over. Correct. Uh, was it Tito Jackson and I guess Janet Jackson as well? I, I don't, I, th I can't remember that, but I remember the Jackson coming by. I remember athletes coming by. Um, uh, Mar but Marcus I, Allen was, came uh, yeah. by. Pretty positive, Marcus. And so I back then I was uh I was just really uncomfortable. So I kind of hit out into my uh, guest house, and uh, but I saw they're having there's food, there's somewhat laughter, and I was uh I just I personally was just uncomfortable, but um that's when I was trying to find a place to live immediately. I wanted to get out. Well, OJ was trying to use you as an alibi. Well, pretty much during one of these get-togethers, where people are dropping off food. Uh, in front of all the people, he, you know, he said, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. And Cato knows I was with him. We were eating in the kitchen. And when he said that, my, that was when I felt like he's lying. I didn't eat in the kitchen. I ate in my room. I was on the phone with my friends and I had, I never saw him again. And when he said that, I just knew he's lying. Hmm. And, uh, I wanted to get out. I wanted to get out immediately because I could see that I was going to be this pawn. Okay. Did OJ try to pull you aside and say, listen, there's about an hour that's unaccounted for. If you just say that we're together, I'm going to give you a million dollars. No, no, nothing, nothing like that. And uh, Which would have been a perfect alibi. Because if you got on the stand and said, OJ was with me during this one, because it was like from 930 to like 1030, I think is the, the time where they said the murder occurred. Mm -hmm. If you just said, yeah, he was with me the whole time, case dismissed, he walks. Yeah, I know. I that was the first one I never brought up. I never I never would I ever do something like that. Yeah. I was there for the truth. But yeah, he definitely said he about me being eating with him in the kitchen. And I in hindsight I was going, This he wants this to be his alibi. Mm -hmm. I can feel it. I can and this is just not truth and I will not lie. Okay, so how long after the actual murder did you move out of the house? Uh I think within three days. Three days. Yeah, two or three days. It was it was pretty quick. Okay. I didn't want to be around. And when I was still there getting myself, I was out staying somewhere else, you know, for the whole day. Okay. Not being around. And you still have the key from the house. I still have the, I still have the guest house key. You have it right now? Yes, I do. Well, I got it. I, I took it off a, a keychain. So I did this and I, when I keep it home, I have to label it the OJ key. So this is my guest house key right <laughs> there. That's it. Uh, which I rarely even locked my door, but this is my, uh, the guest house key still have. This is 28 years later. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, and actually it's a, it's a moment. It actually means something very, very much to me about the, the, my, my life, how it changed basically because of a guest house key. Okay. So uh, how soon after the murder did the funeral occur? Uh, the funeral, I believe it happened within that week. Okay. I think the funeral happened was definitely before the chase. Um, and uh, that was where OJ said, that the Bronco chase, that he was going to visit the uh, uh, cemetery. So it has to happen um, probably within that, that week.
Okay. And the word was that when OJ was there, he said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was like, almost sounded like he was admitting to. Yeah. I just remember him being dark glasses, walking very, you know, uh, like laboriously, uh, almost, uh, I don't know if he was on drugs or not, but it seemed like he was just, he seemed out of it. Yeah. Not talking a lot. And I, I didn't talk, uh, I don't remember even talking to him. I remember talking to the kids a lot. Yeah. There and just hanging out right there. Well, how are the kids taking it? Their mom just got viciously murdered. Yeah. I the the kids took it pretty well. I, I still don't think that it had that impact of uh I, I can't get into their brains, but it seemed like they handled the funeral pretty well. Yeah. Justin especially because he's very young. Well, the police are investigating the situation. They do DNA tests and the blood comes back positive for OJ's blood as well as the victim's blood. And on June 17th, uh, there was an arrest warrant for OJ. OJ's lawyer, uh, Shapiro, was notified at 8.30 that OJ should turn himself in. And uh, Shapiro came back and said, well, can you give him until 11 o'clock? And, uh, you know, the police said, yeah, that's no problem. He's a celebrity. He's probably not going to run. And uh, they agreed to allow him until 12 o'clock yeah. to actually turn himself in. And then things are kind of being set in motion by OJ. Uh, he updated his will. He called his mother and his kids. And he wrote three sealed letters. One to his kids, one to his mother, and one to the public. Over a thousand reporters were gathered in front of the police station waiting for him to turn himself in. But he didn't turn himself in. Right. Uh, LAPD called Shapiro and said that uh, he would be arrested uh, if he didn't turn himself in. And at that point, he became a fugitive. Yep. The public letter was actually read on TV. By Robert uh, Kardashian. Yeah, yeah, with Robert Kardashian. In the letter... OJ said, first, everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. He said that they got into some fights, you know, but they, you know, decided not to reconcile. And as a last wish, the media, he asked not to bother the kids. He also said, I can't go on. He apologized to the Goldman family. Uh, he said, don't feel sorry for me. I have had a great life, great friends. Please think of the real OJ and not this lost person. Most people thought this was a suicide note, right. and his mother actually collapsed and started crying after she heard it. So now begins this search for OJ's Bronco, which, by the way, was supplied by Hertz Rental Car. It's, it's, it's a Hertz Rental. Yes. And uh, eventually, they found the car on the freeway, and. Hence starts the whole famous Bronco police chase. Right. 20 police cars were following OJ's car. OJ was in the car with uh, AC and he had a gun to his head, basically ready to kill himself. At one point during this chase, OJ's former USC coach got on the phone with him and convinced him not to kill himself. By 8 o'clock, O.J. had pulled into his Brentwood estate. There was 27 cops waiting. He waited in the car for about 45 minutes. He eventually got out. He talked to his mother, drank a, a glass of orange juice, <laughs> which the reporters got a kick out of. Man. And he turned himself in. Right. When they searched the car, they found $8,000 in cash, a change of clothing, a loaded 357 Magnum, a passport, and a disguise kit with a fake goatee and a fake mustache. Right. When you're watching all this unfold on television, the whole world is watching. What did you think? I, I thought this is a sociopath, 100%. I thought I had, uh, you know, I didn't hang out with OJ, but there were times that we were out together. Never before is a man that wanted to be adulated by people, no matter what, with having him to say people love him. He wanted people to love him. I think that's what the first of all the letter's about. It's about, remember the real OJ, the one that this doesn't mean. That's a uh, classic sociopath. Mm. And um, I was watching it with friends and I, I just said, 
he's not going to kill himself. This guy, he loves himself way too much. When I, I didn't know about the the mask and all that. No one that was released later, yeah. but that's I think was really an admission of guilt, somewhat of knowing what's he he's going to hide out after he just said that he was going to kill himself. That but he still had eight thousand. He still had the passport. He still had the the mask. So. I think it was just fugitive on the run, escape. Well, he gets booked. You know, he goes to jail. There's no bond. By the time his second arraignment happens on July 22nd, he pleads not guilty. He said absolutely 100% not guilty. Ironically enough, he was actually, at the time that, you know, the murders happened, he was on the board of directors of like 12 different companies. Right. One of the companies was a dis- distributor for Swiss Army Knives. Right. <laughs> He was, he was on the board of Swiss Army and that was dropped right. immediately. Considering that he used it, a knife, well, not used, he allegedly, you know, was accused of using a knife in these murders. He resigned from the board of directors, you know, and <laughs> shortly was, afterwards. And Honey Baked Ham. Honey uh, Baked Ham. Honey okay. Baked Ham was a biggie. All right. So all this is happening. And then on January 25th, 1995, the trial finally begins. And you were a key witness in this trial. Now, you weren't allowed to watch. Right, sequestered from watching. Okay. Uh, You took the stand three times in the trial. Now, what you said somewhat contradicts what OJ's story was. Where did the, where did your testimony and OJ's testimony deviate? Uh, well, one of them was about me being in the house uh, for that uh, after the McDonald's. Um, I, I don't have the transcripts in front of me. I, I just uh, remember that I, I was down there more than six or seven days because I was on hold. But um, I'm trying to think of what uh, the, I, like I said, I don't have the transcripts. So, um, and OJ never took the stand. So I don't know what his testimony, uh, you, you mean his witness statements or his? Well, just the, his defense statements. Oh, um, so they were trying to say that OJ was with you and you said, no, from around 930 to 11 o'clock, I didn't see him. Right. And that was 100% truth that I was not with him. Um, and then I, I kept, they kept asking questions from prosecution to defense of what his mood was. And then they would say, uh, you know, objection. How does he know what the mood is? Mm -hmm. And I just said, he seemed lonely. He seemed, you know, he's coming to my room. That's how lonely is he, that I'm the guy he's talking to. I wasn't even a close friend. So I said, okay, that was, I was just the guy that happened to be around. Yeah. So I think that that's why he was talking to me. Now, you were originally a witness for the prosecution. I am. Yeah, I was a 100% witness for the prosecution. The, the, but the defense questioned you as well, right? Correct. Uh, in many books, from reading books from Vince uh, Bugliosi to Tom Lang, the, the, and they, this is them talking, they said the worst mistake that Marsha Clark made was to declare me a hostile witness. Right. And I didn't even know what that I meant. I thought that meant that I was uh, hostile, at meaning anger and had anything. And if anything, I was very compassionate and talking like I'm talking to you now in conversation. So I didn't know what that was, but it was a different form of questioning. So by that, she gave the defense kind of an open window to me of uh, looking like uh, that I was helping them. Right. By declaring you a hostile witness allowed her to attack yeah. you on the stand without repeated objections from the defense. Correct. And people said this was a, a a key mistake. Yeah, from I did back then. I didn't know law. I didn't know anything about this of being hostile witness. But from reading books and hearing it from other lawyers, that was the, a big mistake on her part. Okay, so the trial goes on, and originally it seemed like a very open and shut case. But the defense had some interesting things that they pulled out. Originally, Mark Furman, they asked him if he ever used the N word. Of that sort. He said, no, I never use it. And then a woman that he was working with on a some sort of project pulled out these tapes right. where he was constantly using the N-word over and over Writing and a book, over right. again. In a movie screenplay. Yeah. And when it came to actually replying to this, he took the fifth. So he didn't even address it to the jury. So essentially it was like, and the jury had a lot of black members on it. Right. So that became a big thing. And then there was the glove. So they had two gloves, one at Bundy, one in, um, at OJ's house. And usually when, you know, it comes to court cases, you never ask a question without knowing the answer. Correct. So the prosecution had OJ put on the glove, not knowing whether it was going to fit or not. 
And when he put it on, it didn't fit. Did not fit. The blood dried, make the gloves smaller. They didn't know what the, uh, you know, the blood on the glove, what it would do to leather. Well, yeah, there was also, you know, in documentaries later on, oh, they that, said right. that uh, he was on some sort of medication that made his hands swell and he purposely didn't take it. So his hands were swollen and so forth. Right. And that ultimately turned into Johnny Cochran's famous phrase, if it don't fit, you must acquit. Right. And Cochran was genius because he knew who the jury was yeah. and he knew the lingo to you. He knew exactly how to use words that they don't understand. And you could see that. That's You could feel that was going to change everything. They are looking for reasonable doubt. And if it don't fit, you must acquit. Right. And the, time the, and the times that you were actually in court, I guess uh, jurors would actually wave to OJ yeah. and he would wave back. So there was a, a level of admiration between the jurors and 100%, OJ. 100%. I, days that I'd be there, they'd wave. I, I was just, I was blown away. Like I, I was thinking it's a double homicide. Uh, the Browns and Goldmans are there, and there's there's waving. And it's I, I to feel what they felt seeing that, of knowing that there's doubt right there, and uh, it was it was just very different. Well, yeah, I mean the trial lasted eleven months, yeah. and during the course, a lot of jurors dropped out, right, because they had jobs and lives and <laughs> you know careers exactly. and so forth. So by the time it got to the end. The jurors that remained were people that were essentially unemployed, were able to take a year off without right. serious consequence to their lives. So you had, you know, people that were, you know, not the most successful, not the most, you know, educated and so forth. This is what the jury was left with right. after that time. And I think people also, were, it's the first time in history, people are probably going, God, I hope I get jury duty. <laughs> yeah. During this, they're like, oh, I want to be on this jury. Yeah. October 2nd, the verdict is read. Not guilty. Were you with Barbara Walters when this was happening? I was uh, sitting, uh, as I'm sitting here, Barbara Walters is sitting next to me and she looked at me. I whispered her, I go, I think they made a huge mistake. And uh, I think with time that's gone by, I think more and more people see that now. And I think in this being 2023 right now, I think the majority of people think OJ is guilty. And I think he has his fans regardless yeah, I think people are, they, they overlook that. I think people that know that he did it still will ask for the autograph. I think people still will go, hey, OJ. Um, but I also think there's many people that would have no, no contact with him. So when they said not guilty, you felt he was really guilty? Yeah. I, th I felt there was a mistake after knowing everything. Yes. Well, you know, there is, there's lots of theories that are coming out mm -hmm. that continue to come out. One of the theories is that his oldest son, which had a, you know, a history of violence. He was also, I think, a chef, so he was using knives. Correct. They felt that the son killed Nicole and Ron. OJ may have been there, but he's covering for his son because he doesn't want his son to go to prison forever. What do you think of that theory? I, I think every theory is, is made up and they're just theories. And I, me personally, I think it, he is uh, pretty much 100% the at guilt. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's close to his son, but I don't think it was that closeness of him to talk about relationships with his son, about, hey, uh, I'm having these fights with Nicole's. I mean, I didn't see that. Could it happen? Maybe. But no, I, I think uh, any theory that's coming out, it's because people want to have a theory and they want to be related to this trial somehow. Yeah. I mean, the other theory was, like I mentioned earlier, uh, they said Nicole uh, slapped the maid and her family took revenge on her by killing her and on a slap, I know. I mean, the theory, I actually, it's 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 very strange because I have people to this day that come up and have theories they want to give me. Hmm. And when I was living in a different place, I used to have notes under my door where they find out where I live. I mean, twelve page notes of a, a gentleman with this. Did you ever see the movie Seven? Yeah. Do you remember Kevin Spacey how he used to write those little? I, it was the same kind of writing. I was freaking out of this guy's <laughs> theory, and he had the the blueprints of the house and everything. I was like, this is. I have that somewhere still too. Okay, and you feel that OJ did it and he did it by himself? Yeah. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I feel that because after meeting with detectives, having this is the most investigated case in the history of murder cases. Mm. Over 150 detectives of people brought in to investigate this case. And every one of them said that their evidence points to one person, and that person is OJ Simpson. Well, uh, the Barbara Walters, 
uh, interview got released right afterwards. Because like you said, you were right with her yeah. when, you know, the verdict was read. In the interview, Barbara said that some people felt like you were trying, you were lying to protect OJ. Right. What do you say to that? I was, I was the most truthful person ever on the stand. I was truthful in everything I said. And uh, there is a, there's a reason, as I, I met with Marsha Clark, I was her witness. I've met with her for hours and hours and hours in her office. Mm -hmm. So at times we'd go over questions. When I was on the stand and the question wasn't one that we did like a review on, I looked like I was a deer in the headlights because I'm trying to remember. What, I don't remember this question. And that comes across as, uh, I, I, I could see how people say that the camera's right on you. It's like, oh, he's lying in that. But I wasn't lying. I was thinking of the right answer. I had never been in a courtroom in my entire life at that age. Never. Not No parking tickets. I wanted to make sure that I was making every answer correct. I wanted to make sure this is a double homicide with a, a, you know, with a, a woman that I knew. I don't know Ron, but I know now uh, that I know he's a great, great guy of knowing his uh, uh, sister. So I wanted to make sure I answered everything correctly. Well, Barbara Walter, she asked you, at that interview, would you continue a friendship with OJ? And you said, well, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you saw that. I, I, I would, no, I would not have a friendship with OJ. Yeah. And you never got any sort of payment or anything else like that from OJ no. after the fact, before the fact, nothing. Nothing. Never seen him. Nothing. I saw him in the civil trial. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was um, the two years after, I think, the civil trial. And that was just in, the, in a men's room and I was peeing. So I didn't have much to say. Well, uh, Robert Shapiro, who was one of the, he wasn't the head lawyer. I mean, Cochran was the head lawyer, but he was part of the, the dream team. Well, I think he was the head lawyer and then he got, they switched it to Johnny. There was oh, okay. a big got animosity it. between them because of that. Got it. Well, uh, Shapiro always said that he didn't want to play the race card when it came to this trial, but he said that Johnny Cochran played the race card from the bottom of the deck. He said he would never work with Cochran or F. Lee Bailey ever again, right. which ended up being true. Well, especially since they're both dead now, too. Yeah. So he's never going to work with them. Exactly. But uh, yeah, and it, it actually became true. Well, you became somewhat of a celebrity yourself. You showed up on Mad TV. I was the first host on Mad TV. Yep. Did two episodes of that. And you were on Politically both. Correct with Bill Maher. You were on a HBO sketch comedy show called Mr. Show with Bob and David. Man, yeah, Bob and David. So now you're kind of in the limelight suddenly. What was that like? Um, well, it's, it's sort of like, uh, here was a struggling actor coming out from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it's the first, and the next thing you know, people know my name and I became, uh, I guess the celebrity, but I, like I said before, I also not only became that I was labeled the pariah. Yeah. I was labeled a freeloader. I was labeled a traitor. And, uh, I basically became an assassin's target when I just, you know, I, I, I say that never has a man done so little to be recognized by so many. You know, when you talk about some of the some of the things people are saying about you, it, it ended up kind of bleeding into popular culture. So, for example, a tribe called Quest, they had a song called The Hop, right? And uh, one of the rappers, Fife Dog, he had a line said, I packed it in like Van Halen. I work for mine. You, you're freeloading like Kato Kalin. Thanks. <laughs> you heard <laughs> yeah. the song? I don't know, but uh, uh, by tr uh, Tribe Called Quest, I know yeah. the band. I don't know that song. I know the uh, uh, Tupac song. Uh, there's a song about... That, remember. Uh, uh, shed no more tears and they when i had my radio show they came by to play it for my show and that's uh remember kato and it's well, a, kato i think was a friend of tupac's right. it's not the same kato no but was kato named kato from me or not no i don't think so okay i think Pac had a had a, a guy named kato that he was close to it's not the same kato yeah but they came by the i remember them coming by and dropping off tape to play it then okay yeah, but uh tupac's, i think they just confused it i mean yeah. you know Kato's not a popular so I, name. I played it for him anyways. I played it when I was on, uh, you know, it's Howard Stern and me on the show. Okay. So well, there's another artist named uh, Charlie Robinson. He had a song called Sunset Boulevard, uh, Caviar and Cocaine. Have you heard this? I heard that song, but what's my, what's the... He said, uh, I wish I knew a movie star, someone like Charlie Sheen, because if, he, if he'd hang out with Kato Kalin, well, I guess he'd hang out with me. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm so good that I can laugh at these things. I think they are hilarious. Yeah, right. it's funny stuff. And uh, and look, Charlie, GC, Charlie's a great guy. Right, because there's a picture of you and Charlie Sheen at a Padres game. Oh, yeah, I hung out with Charlie. We, 90s, were, uh, did a thousand things together. Oh, you guys actually knew each other and hung out? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did a table read for a film. And, uh, you know, I was at Charlie's company back then. was at Nick Cassavetes. And Nick's great from uh, uh, The Notebook and his father, John Cassavetes. And they had a company, uh, ETA. And so I'd be at their offices in Calabasas. 
you know, all the time. So, uh, and uh, Charlie would rent a baseball field. We played baseball probably every weekend hmm. for at least a year. Wow. So yeah, he's greatest. That's a whole nother interview, but he is the most benevolent person, so kind to other people. And he never wants other people to know what he's done for him. And he's, uh, he's top notch, top shelf. Well, by 1997, there was the OJ civil trial mm-hmm. with the Goldman family. The Brown family didn't actually try to sue him or anything else like that, right? No, they're part of the civil trial. Oh, they're part of the same yeah, Goldman. They're part of, uh, yeah, okay, they're part of the civil trial. Well, uh, leading up to the civil trial, there was a deposition. Right. And you and OJ were actually in the same room together for the first time yeah. since the murders occurred. Right. Uh, I was with the, in a room quite a, a few days, actually, for my deposition. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's in the, as close as I'm to, close to you in a room, and uh, they're asking me all the same sort of questions of going on. And he was just sort of much, his attitude was sort of like, oh, I'm not going to pay this no matter what happens. And that's what I was feeling from him. He's just in the room with his uh, uh, attorney at the time, was Robert Baker, I believe his name was. So I was there and uh, I just answered all the questions uh, truthfully. Right. And, and uh, I guess in the bathroom, the two of you actually started to talk. Uh, he started to talk. I was peeing. Yeah. In the bathroom, he talked and he just said, hey, well, okay, though. And this is after I'd been in the room the whole time, not you know, being truthful, but I guess to him, it's be dissing on him. I said, uh, oh, nothing. And I just took off. Okay. And he was like, hey, what's up, Cato? Yeah. And you yeah, were just the like- I, was, I was actually really <laughs> peeing. I was like, you know, I was like, I'm not going to shake his hand or anything. Was that sort of surprising how kind of lighthearted he was with you, considering that you yeah, kind of was, testified against him in a way? Yeah, it was It was done kind of like that, uh, hey, what up, Cato? That, that sort of, uh, it was a, uh, wasn't joyful, but it was just dropping a line in the conversation. Hey, what up? And uh, nothing. And washed the hands and I left. Well, the jury unanimously found uh, OJ liable in the wrongful death and battery against Goldman and battery against Brown. He was ordered to pay $33.5 million in damages. Shortly afterwards, he defaulted on the mortgage of the Brentwood home. The bank foreclosed on it. Uh, I guess the house was bought by uh, Kenneth Abdallah, who was the president of uh, Jerry's Famous Deli, who ended up basically tearing the house down yeah. and rebuilding it. Uh, the Goldman family tried to collect OJ's $28,000 a month pension. They couldn't do it. Uh, the Heisman Trophy was sold, and they got about half a million dollars to that. But ultimately, they got a very small amount of money, the whole $33.5 million just yeah. did not happen. And I think they're still trying to get it up, uh, any kind of work that he gets. And he, and you know, he does, uh, I, I think if he gets work, it's, it must be cash payments or something that he can't declare because I think it would go to, he'd have to give money to the Goldmans and the Browns. Right. Because I guess he was living, well, I guess he moved to Florida around that time yeah. and they couldn't take his house. Right. In and Florida. I, you know, I don't know the legality of all, but I also think the trusts were in the kids' names too. Aha. Uh-huh. And you can't take it from the kids. Yeah. And you never saw the kids or talked to the kids after that? Uh, no. Uh, the, the last time I saw them was at the funeral. I yeah. think it was funeral. Might have, might have been a few times after, but nothing. It was definitely nothing past the 94. Well, by 2006, Nicole's neighbor, who called the police and said that he heard the cries and the dog barking and everything else like that, Pablo Van Heves, he was actually a writer himself. Mm-hmm. And him and OJ decided to put together a book. The neighbor? Yeah. Of Nicole's? Yeah. And OJ, I, this is, this yeah, is, exactly. I, I've never even heard this. Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. They put together a book called If I Did It, where it was a hypothetical description of the actual murders. Simpson's old manager, Norman Pardo, said that uh, Simpson wasn't involved in the writing of the book, but rather accepted uh, $600,000 from Reagan Books, which was an imprint of HarperCollins, uh, to say that he had written it and conducted an interview. It was originally supposed to come out, but then after a whole bunch of people were upset over it, uh, they ended up scrapping it. Uh, in 2007, uh, during a bankruptcy court uh, procedure, they actually awarded the rights of the book to the Goldman family. And the book's title was changed to, If I Did It, Confessions of the Killer, but the if was actually made in really small letters. So if you didn't look at it carefully, you just said, I did it. Confessions of a killer. I, this is, uh, you're blowing me away with this. Yeah. The, uh, so are you, 
if you know the answer, did he keep the 600,000? I mean, it was at like a- I'm um, not sure. Pay, I wonder how that went. With yeah, I'm not the, sure. Trust. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Now, I kind of remember going back in time. I think he did a, a television special with that right that woman where they did a, a Q&A, if I'm not mistaken, there's something maybe online. Where he, they sat and they talked about yeah that yeah well, there was an interview around it that Fox yeah. was supposed to put out but I guess they scrapped it but it came out later on okay that's yeah, what, I yeah. remember something so big news like that the, the whole thing is crazy so essentially OJ was found not guilty he continued to live his life he was playing golf everything was going cool until September thirteenth two thousand and seven OJ and a group of three men go to a hotel in Vegas to basically retrieve a bunch of memorabilia mm -hmm. that OJ owned. Uh, in the process, some guns were taken out, yep. pointed at the guy who I guess accidentally recorded the whole incident. Two days later, OJ was arrested. Three other men, they actually took plea deals to testify against OJ. On October 3rd, OJ was found guilty of all charges. He was sentenced to 33 years in prison, the possibility of parole after nine years. And I remember the judge in the case, she said, this is not payback yeah. for the Nicole Brown, uh, Ron Goldman uh, situation. But a lot of people looked at it going like, it's 33 back. years mm -hmm. for getting your stuff back. People do murders and get less than that. Yeah. When you heard about the verdict in that second case, what'd you think? I pretty much thought the same thing you're thinking. I thinking I was thinking 33 years, a long time. And I definitely said that is payback and that's going to bite him. He's going to have a harder sentence there in Vegas than he get in LA. So I thought that, the, yeah, he, I, I thought now he's serving time. And I think it's really important to know, you know, that saying birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. I always noticed that OJ, even after the first trial, I always noticed that he was in the news for everything that was negative. And it was always about these bad people he, met, he was associated with. He always had a bad set of friends after. And he always seemed to be going to jail or in trouble and getting into trouble. And then the Vegas thing happened. And this after he got in trouble in Florida also. I forget yeah. for what. Yeah, I remember like his house so, was raided and some other stuff happened. So much yeah. stuff. Like maybe a, a girl, uh, I, like I, I don't know. So, But I know that there was news stories. He was always getting in trouble. And then, the, of course, hanging out with these other guys in Vegas getting arrested. And I think it just kind of came to a head. It's like, it's going to hit me. It's going to get you sooner or later to get it. And he got it and he got it good. Yeah. So he goes to prison. And then in 2017, on October 1st, he got released from prison. Uh, he served almost nine years. He got off on parole uh, based on good behavior. Uh, and then on uh, December 14, 2021, four years later, uh, he was actually released off parole, which effectively made him a free man. Uh, when you saw OJ getting out of prison, I remember there was a video of him at the gas station and everything else like that. What did you think? You know, I, I kind of, I, you know, in my life from the trial, I kept thinking that um, it's always going to be part of my life. But the more I, I can do, it's like, uh, boy, I can't change anything of the past. I can only own my future and the present of how I can make my future better. So I kind of forgot that. And I said, I, I just moved on and I, I didn't pay attention to the OJ stuff. If I saw it, I go, you know. So OJ, uh, uh, I'm sure he's going to get in trouble again. And uh, I, I think personally, what he's going to go down with never telling anybody the truth and, and he'll die with that. Well, he's 75 years old now. And, you know, you see him on Twitter. He's living his best life. He's usually on the golf course, having a good time. It, it, you're right. And it always blows me away that I don't follow him on Twitter, but everybody tags me. And it bothers me so much. <laughs> they put anything that's OJ related, it's mine, Aunt Cato Kalen. And I go, God, I wish they'd hate to do that because I pop up and I look at it. But you're right. And it's like, God, there's, there's women that still love him. There's, there's yeah. men that put autographs. There's a partier. But I always think there's, that's the side you can see. There's always another side. It's, it's good and bad. And, and uh, that's, that's going to be the rest of his life with good and bad. Yeah. I mean, we've, uh, we've spoken to, you know, his go-to guy about doing an interview mm -hmm. and uh you know we were talking about various numbers and so forth and originally it was like he was willing to do it he just didn't want to talk about anything to do with the murder case and i'm like well i'm not going to do that interview I mean, yeah what's the I, point I mean, i'm not going to do an interview about his you know football career and so right. forth and they actually approached me again recently about doing it and we started to have our talks again and then those talks kind of fell off 
And then he ended up doing an interview on the Full Send podcast. And the highlight of that interview was whether he was Khloe Kardashian's real father. And? He said he wasn't. Uh, You know, but that was like- That's nothing. That was not gonna be a Vlad TV interview. I was, I think they found someone that was willing to do a softball interview. They knew that with me, that wasn't gonna happen. So Vlad, I, here's what I don't understand. And I don't know, you never, you only talk to his people. Yeah. Or his I haven't person. talked to him. I mean, I DM'd him on Twitter and he hit me back with that person's name. So right. I haven't talked to him directly. Does it make sense that he wrote a book? He, he goes to If I Did and all that, that he doesn't want to talk about it. Is it because of uh, legality? He thinks he'll, you can get him to, you know, I don't know because I, I would think that, I think people want to see you know, after the Academy Award winning the ESPN documentary, the, the I guess, 18 Emmys, whatever, for the uh, Ryan Murphy yeah. uh, American crime story. Yeah. And it's like, there's so much you can pick up and get him to I don't know, slip up or whatever. But I think I think he's going to do it. Uh, you know, it's not good. It's, I think he wants, I think he loves it so much that he wants to go on. And, and once again, if you if you give him these questions... He says he doesn't want to answer the questions, but I think he, I think if you do it the right way, which mm. I think you do, mm. you know, who, who knows? I, I I can't say, but you think that, uh, I think maybe he's got so many people that think, oh, they forgot about it. I'm going to just live my life or I, I don't know. I mean, look, it's hard to say because there's a double jeopardy rule, which means that since he was found not guilty, he could technically talk about it and they can't charge him. Is, right? that, is that a talking point you brought up to them? Uh, no. No, I mean, we didn't get that far. We didn't really get that far. Uh, you know, I mean, we have the budget for a major interview like this. Yeah. But ultimately, yeah, he technically can't be charged. But my feeling is he's going to die with this information. Because if he came forward and said, yeah, I really killed those two people, I think that the overall hatred and backlash from the few fans that he has, like he would lose whatever fan base he's ever had. Right. And he still has that fan base. I mean, listen, I've interviewed a lot of people and I brought up his name and some people think, well, he was found not guilty. And yeah, you know, there really was a racist cop that was established. And, uh, you know, when you talk about like the black community, you see what happens with white racist cops and black people historically. Yeah. You know, even, you know, down to the George Floyd situation. Right. Imagine if there was no cameras with George Floyd. That cop could have, would probably have walked away from it. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, they they created, you know, the whole racist cop and the glove not fitting. They created a legitimate reasonable doubt. Now, if I was on the jury, I would have said guilty, but, you know, I also don't have the same experience as an African-American person in America. Right. And it also has to do with the Rodney King case. There's a Rodney and King case that happened in LA as well. So 92 people. Three. Well, I mean, there was also leading up to the Rodney King situation. There was also the the black girl that got shot by the Vietnamese uh, store owner. You know about that? No. Is that during the LA riots? That was before the LA riots. Okay. Basically what happened was there was a, a black girl, um, Latasha, who came into this um, uh, Korean owned uh, corner store and the woman behind the counter accused her of stealing like a soda you know, an argument ensued where they try to, the woman tried to grab her bag and she kind of fought back and started to think like punch the woman or something. And when she turned around, the woman shot her in the back of the head oh. and killed her. It went to trial and the woman was found guilty by the, the jury, but the judge decided to give her probation oh. as opposed to yeah, sending her to prison. And that was basically what set the stage for Rodney King because LA was so upset over the situation right. and that when Rodney King happened and when he was found, you know, when the cops were found not guilty, it was like, man, fuck this. Yeah. Like this keeps happening over and over again and we're sick of it. Yeah. We're gonna burn down the city. So yeah, and this leads into the OJ situation, which essentially went the other way. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So. No, completely. Yeah. I, I saw it. I know that's part of the jury. It was like, it's uh, they were gonna say, forget it, this guy's not gonna get convicted. Yeah. It's a possibility. In 2019, you're actually on a Celebrity Big Brother. Right. Uh, you were uh, evicted by a 5-0 and vote uh, on uh, February After 21 4th. days, though, so yeah. give, me, give me a little credit. A little bit of credit, <laughs> yeah. You finished eighth place out of 12, uh, 12 guests. Oh, no, no, I was in eighth place. No, 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 no. I was down to the, I was down to, uh, gotta be, it's gotta be at least the top six people. Okay, my bad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, I was only there. I missed out only on like three days. Okay, my bad. No, that's all right. Yeah. But that was, uh, 
it was great. It was so cathartic for me because I start seeing on the Twitter and my Instagram and all that that I, 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 you got. I sort of got a fan base that wasn't OJ related, <laughs> yeah. and um, it was. God, it was such a really good feeling, and uh, and uh, you know, I was also I did a court show in two thousand four and five, one hundred and forty eight episodes of Eye for an Eye, where I was the, you know, the judge had a baseball bat of justice named Extreme Akeem genius guy <laughs> and that show was syndicated all over the world and also you know we had a one-hour block ktla here nice. and uh, then in kcal so it was uh, all over america and i started you know working well you were known as america's favorite house guest mm -hmm. and but now you fast forward 2023 you actually own your own house yeah and i don't mind it i'm kidding well, and your goal is to actually have your own house guests in the back. Yes. Yes, it is. I own my own house. And yeah, I would love to have my own guest house in back. Yeah. And I would put my best buddies up there and they'd love it. Right. So yeah, that's a, that's a goal. And it'll happen. It'll happen eventually. It'll happen. And what are you working on now? Well, there's uh, quite a few things. Uh, one thing is, uh, uh, like you, I, I follow you on all your social medias and uh, I have a, a podcast. And it's sort of this, in this vein, it's uh, One Degree of Scandalous and it's co with Tom Zenner, who was a broadcaster of NBC and Fox and uh, sports and the news. And we cover uh, current scandals and scandals from the past, but uh, we're subscribed on YouTube, One Degree of Scandalous. And we've had guests on uh, from uh, the uh, Britney Spears' first husband, to Tom Lang, a detective who wrote Evidence Dismissed. So a lot of the information of this OJ the interview, I, I stayed in contact with Tom. Uh, but that one degree of scandalous. Uh, also, I produce and host a uh, Ice Wars. What's Ice Wars? Glad I'm going to tell you. Ice Wars is a. Um, uh, if you ever watch hockey, you people watch hockey basically for the fights. Well, we cut out the hockey and just go right to the fights. Just the fights. Just the fights. So we're on our third pay per view coming up, and uh, it's with uh, creators Charlie Nama. And if anybody's watched uh, uh, Netflix until Crimes and Penalties, uh, AJ Galante is the president of our league. So. Uh, it's gone really successful with Barstool loving it and Pat McAfee. So really proud about that. I've been at the stadiums and we sell out and the crowd loves it. And I just wrote something and we'll see if it gets on called Wrong Place, Wrong Time as a host. And it has a lot to do with crime of being uh, other people involved in crimes that uh, they're at the wrong place at the wrong time. And um, uh, that's it. And finished with Pastor John Gray, who was Obama's and Oprah, the pastor, and uh, Teen Court, he's the judge. I am the court representative, and I interview all the people in this where teens are now taking their parents to court over certain mm -hmm. things from getting a butt lift, uh, finding out when it's a jury of their peers, and it's the arguments that ensue, and we just shot three episodes, and we'll see where the pitch goes on. Teen Court, which I think will be highly successful, and it's John Gray is ama amazing as the judge. Pretty busy. I'm yeah. getting that guest house, Vlad. Oh, yeah, you're getting it. You're absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Come on, Vlad, it. give it up for the K train. Let's give it up. Well, Kato, I appreciate you coming in. I mean, being a part of the trial of the century, which you're talking about, this happened in 1993. I mean, 93 is when it started with the preliminary, preliminary trials, right. and then it goes into 94. Right. So you're talking about 30 years later. Yeah. And this is still the biggest trial of my lifetime. Yeah, uh, Vlad, I'll tell you, anytime there's a trial that comes up, anytime there's anything from the Johnny Depp trial recently, every network will call me up for my opinion. Yeah. And it's it's not, it just happens. I, there's nothing I can do about it for my opinion. And uh, I just, uh, uh, I offered if they wanted, but I, I rarely try to call them, but I'm always associated with, with a crime. And so that's why I said, you know what, Cato, embrace it and and pitch a show like a wrong place, wrong time. And and uh, teen court, you got to, if you're known for it, but I want everybody to know that my personality is really about light and I love people and I'm always about high energy of all good things, all positive. Well, last question. If OJ Simpson walked in this room right now and sat down next to you, what would you ask him? I, w I would basically say, did you do it? Why did you do it? And how can you live it yourself? How do, those would be my three questions. And knowing OJ, how do you think he would answer that? I don't think he'd answer it all. And I think he would deny everything. Yeah. Well, Cato, appreciate you coming in. Good luck on all the new projects. Good luck on the guest house. Thanks a lot, Vlad. <laughs> we'll talk soon. I'm looking around the room here. Is there a surprise? <laughs> Vlad, what are you doing to me? <laughs> Peace. Peace to you.